Okay, good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Peter Armitage. I'm the CEO of Anchor Capital. And I'd like to welcome you all to our fourth quarter, Where Will the Money Be Made uh, seminar or webinar. Um, I think this is probably the first webinar to be held in South Africa, subsequent to us being uh, having won the two, 2023 World Cup uh, as Rugby World Cup champions. So lots of happy faces in the office. Uh, but unfortunately, October wasn't a fantastic month uh, for, for investment markets. Uh, but we think there's some pretty nice opportunities lined up. And we've got a star-studded cast to tell you about what the future holds. So I'm going to kick off with Nolan Varpenau, who's our uh, co-chief investment officer and uh, head of fixed income. And I think Nolan's probably got a more exciting story to tell that, uh, than at any time in the history of our business. So over to you, Nolan. Thank you very much, Peter. And I definitely will re reiterate what you said, which is that scheduling this today is a, is a test of, you know, whose voices will hold up after this weekend. It, it was fantastic. But welcome, everybody, and thank you for dialing in to where the money will be made. Um, the last one for this year, fourth quarter of 2023. And it's a very different one, very exciting one. And the way I look at it is it is the light at the end of the tunnel or maybe the light at the end of the road. And we're going to expand on our views for, um, for coming, the coming quarter and coming year. In this regard, what I want to do is start by looking at what I deem to be the most important charts in the world at the moment, the charts that really capture what has been going on. And the first of these charts is, um, is in front of you. And what you've, what you've got here is a chart which shows you the 20 year history of the US interest rates. And that's the blue line. So you can kind of see the blue line and then um, the 2000 and sort of mid 2000 hiking cycle, hit the global financial crisis, emergency cuts, interest rates bubbled around close to zero. And as things normalized, we hit COVID, emergency cuts. And then what you've got sort of towards the right end is the fastest interest rate hiking cycle in history. Now, that is what we've been living through for the last three years. That is what has dominated investment markets. Whether you're invested in bonds, in equities, any risk assets, you've certainly felt this pressure. Right on the right-hand side, you've got a sort of shaded blue line. And this is what the US Federal Reserve is telling us they're going to do in the future. And basically, what you're seeing is a flat line. Higher for longer. Interest rates stay higher for longer. Against this, we've also got the inflation rate, and that's that brown line, so the squiggly line. You can see how it sort of bumbled around. Then after the global financial crisis sort of came down a bit, normalized, bubbled around, and then you can see how in inflation got out of control come, um, <clears throat> you know, after, after COVID, and you can see how it's been coming, how it's been coming down of late. Very important, what is the Fed telling us, what are economists telling us? They're saying that inflation should continue the trend downwards, and by the end of next year, inflation ends at about 2.5%. Now, what I really want to look at today is the difference between these two. So if I look on the left-hand side here, interest rates at about 5%, inflation at 2%. That means that um, your interest rates were 3% higher than inflation. If you're investing in cash at that point in time, you are earning CPI plus 3 so let's graph the difference, and that's what you've got on this graph here. And you can kind of see how um, you know the um, the graph moved up to that three percent level there. From an economic perspective, this is really what what matters far more than the absolute level of interest rates. This is like the handbrake that slows the economy when when the Reserve Bank hikes. So it's how how positive are interest rates above inflation? And you can see if you want um, looking along here how in the early 2000s, the central banks pulled the handbrake up, slowed down the US economy to such a point that there was then a crisis within the mortgage sector, a crisis within the housing sector, and the central banks then had to cut interest rates quite urgently. And we lived in a very stimulatory environment for the next decade. As things normalized, we had COVID and it became an incredibly stimulatory environment, much more than we've seen in many, many years. And this in of itself created a bit of an inflation problem. And you can see how the central banks yanked the handbrake up, slowing down the economies. And that forecast, if we take that um, going forward, is that this handbrake will continue to come up over the next year. So that's, that's what we're talking about as an expectation. The thing is, it's the absolute level. It's how hard you're pulling on that handbrake that slows the economy. Last time we had the um, handbrake up as far as we do today, something broke. 
and we entered into a 10-year crisis or a crisis that took 10 years to recover from the mortgage crisis. Reserve banks, central banks are telling us they're going to hike um, rates, they're going to pull that handbrake up to the same level, and the market is concerned. You never know what's going to break, unfortunately, until it is broken. Some people are pointing at, um, at private debt. Some people are pointing at commercial mortgages, real estate um, sort of um, shopping mall mortgages, and saying there might be a problem here. We don't really know. But what we do know is that pulling the handbrake up this high, this hard, has typically led to problems. So that's how we're thinking about the world. So what does that mean for, in, um, for us? Well, there really are three different scenarios. And the first scenario, and I think Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan is a proponent of this scenario, is that actually the US economy is a lot stronger than people think. And therefore, we will be able to continue with a handbrake up this high, with interest rates this high for longer. And as a consequence, um, growth will remain strong in the US, strong growth last quarter, and um, you know, higher for longer is the reality. The second aspect of it, though, is, and this is where Anchor hangs its hat, this is where we are, which is my uh, middle of the road scenario, says that if you keep the handbrake up this high, if you keep interest rates this high, you are going to see growth slow down. It doesn't mean something breaks. It doesn't mean you know, we're all going to have a calamitous crash. It just means that the economy sort of gradually slows. And at some point, the Federal Reserve looks at this and says inflation is in line with where it needs to be. Economy is slowing unnecessarily. We can actually release the handbrake. We can start to cut interest rates. And we are talking about interest rate cuts in the second half of next year. The third scenario that we have to be cognizant of is that you know, with the brakes being pulled this hard, something breaks. And as a result, what you start to see is a, is a harder landing um, in, in the US environment and sort of faster interest rate cuts within, um, within the US. So those are the three scenarios that, that, we, that we're thinking about. And if we tie that back to our asset allocation, it actually becomes very interesting. And what Peter was talking about is, if you think about those scenarios, the first scenario is pretty neutral for bonds. The second and third scenario are actually very bond positive. So we're in a, in a world where you know, the outlook, particularly for global bonds, is actually quite positive in the majority of the scenarios. And in the scenarios where it isn't that positive, it's still actually a decent outcome. So, so for the first time in Anchor's history, we actually are favoring global bonds as an asset class. And that's, that's um, what's coming through our asset allocation. So if we look here, what we've got is the sort of middle of the road scenario that Anchor was talking about, the other two scenarios and expected returns. And then looking at the global um, asset allocation, we're leaning into global bonds uh, for the first time in preference over equities. Um, longer term, we do like equities. Equities have historically outperformed bonds, but we do think that the bond season is upon us for the next six to 12 months. And we think that there is an opportunity there for investors. Domestically, we're in a situation where what I've described becomes a lot more positive for the domestics as well. It, it is the global environment becomes supportive, but we have the domestic environment that is pulling in the opposite direction. And what you end up with is this tug of war between a difficult domestic environment and a more supportive global environment. That means we see um, more volatility in South Africa. And we think that overall, um, the global environment probably wins. So we see a slightly supportive outcome, but less so because of what's, what's happening on the ground here. So from that perspective, we're probably more, we're pursuing offshore more and we do think global bonds. Looking at global yields, just to pull it all together, what is the outlook or what have I said? I've said that US 10-year bonds have a yield of 4.8%. It's about 5% right now. It's sort of risen in the last few days. So if you just invest for 10 years, you're going to earn 5% in the US. Now that's CPI plus three, which is quite attractive. And most of the scenarios that I've outlined actually point towards additional capital gains on top of that. Some of the scenarios actually point to quite significant capital gains, um, you know, double digit returns on bonds. And we do think that this needs to be a part of your asset allocation. Anchor BCI Global Flexible Income Fund or the Anchor Global High Yield Fund. Those are both great opportunities to invest in this asset class. We think that there is an attractive risk reward relationship where most of the signals are pointing towards quite a positive outcome. But obviously we've got to keep an eye on it and we're watching US economic data. I think Q4 is going to be soft. 
However, it should reaccelerate in the next quarter. And obviously, the Federal Reserve is meeting later this week, and we want to keep an eye on what they say. We want to keep an eye on signaling. We're expecting them at this stage to signal higher for longer, um, but it's, it is very much our view that that signaling is subtly going to shift towards cuts are coming over the next quarter or two. Looking domestically, domestically, we're all talking about one thing, and we're talking about shrinking tax collection. We're talking about the fact that corporate taxes in specific have um, declined quite, quite significantly, mining profits in specific um, because of lower commodity prices. This is having an impact on our government because at this stage, um, the finance minister is walking a very, very tight line. And there are a lot of concerns about it. In fact, the business day this morning has got a picture of Sia Khaleesi, but adjacent to that, the next article is about our finance minister playing, playing defense. Very clearly, the, the message of you can't spend as freely as you want to, previously did is not going down within, uh, with, well with the politicians. But let's dig into that a bit. Our numbers are indicating that the shortfall, the tax shortfall, will be about 50 billion rand. Additionally, looking at this, we think that, um, you know, there are some quick wins for, for the minister. We think that um, just not allocating money to people who, who didn't spend it last, last year. So if you didn't spend the money, you're not getting another shot at it this year. Actually, that probably saves you about 25 billion in of itself. Additionally, moving a couple of people from uh, into early retirement from government through to the PRC takes them off the government payroll. The PRC is very generous. I actually think it's probably in people's interests. And as a result, what you end up with is you know, additional savings. So where I'm going to is that you, you start with 50 billion, you make these changes. Actually, your, your problem is about 15 to 20 billion rand. A significant amount of money, but not insurmountable. And that's, that's the point, is that, you know, a little bit of tight planning right now, the minister can address most of this. We are going to see increased borrowing. I think that the minister's clearly signaled that, but it's not catastrophic. It is a manageable situation. And we've got to take a, a view on the long-term challenges in South Africa. And the way I'd look at it is the Springboks came from behind to beat the French. Um, the Springboks came from behind to beat the English by one point. And right now, our economy is coming from behind as well. And what do we need to do to address these challenges? It really is the state sectors, the state-owned enterprises. We need to fix ESKIM, we need to fix water supply, we need to fix Transnet, and we need to see more meaningful prosecution of corruption. Those are the key challenges that we're actually looking to get addressed. And these are probably right now more important than you know the, 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 the last decimal point on the budget. So from that perspective, I think that this is really where the focus needs to be. And that's the communication. As we said for domestic bonds, though, um, you know, the yield is very high. The yield is attractive. You're earning a percent a month. Most scenarios are pointing towards smaller capital gains, but there's going to be this sort of tug of war between global factors and domestic factors. That's going to, that's going to make for a more volatile investment. Um, we are very closely watching the medium-term budget policy statement on Wednesday, and we're watching very specifically for commitment to state-owned enterprise reform. From an election perspective, at this stage, we're you know you've got to be cognizant of the potential outcomes and position accordingly. But we're we're looking for a sort of more moderate um, outcome within Anchor's environment. So from that perspective, we like bonds. We prefer offshore bonds. Domestic bonds definitely have a place in your portfolio. I think at a percent a year or what is effectively going to be CPI plus six domestically, you do want to be invested in bonds as well. Finally, just pulling it together, Anchor takes a view, it needs to have a view on the RAND as well. And we subscribe to the purchasing power parity model. So that's what's in front of you. And that sort of stable black line with a blue band around it is our view of the fair value of the RAND. The jagged line actually shows you where the RAND trades, and clearly the RAND does not listen to our particular um, views. So, um, or to, the, the RAND doesn't listen to our spreadsheet. But looking at this, what we did is we sat with um, one of the other banks, I think it was First RAND RMB, and they've, they've done a bit of work on, on the RAND and why it is so different to, from, from where the fair value is. And what they were coming out with is it's actually, you know, the, our fair value is at about 15 Rand. The Rand is trading at about 19 Rand. So there's a four Rand difference. 
Two rand of that difference they ascribe to the fastest US rate hiking cycle in living memory, to the sudden interest rate hikes, to the very strong dollar, and actually that in and of itself accounts for about two rand of weakness for ourselves. The other two rand of weakness comes from South African failures. It comes from South Africa's um, you know, domestic challenges um, and our inability to sort of deal with some of them. So from that perspective, um, you know, how are we looking at the RAND? We're saying that, yeah, I'm not convinced that the South African domestic um, aspects are going to be remedied in the short term, but the cyclical aspect, which relates to the dollar strength, definitely could be remedied. We definitely could see some RAND recovery from that as well. So we, we can't write the RAND off yet, but, you know, clearly it's, it's been under pressure and will remain under pressure for a while. Um, from Anchor's perspective, we're modeling against a round of 1930 in a year's time. So broadly sideways, a little bit weaker than today as, you know, as we move through the cycle with a potential propensity for a little bit of recovery thereafter. And with that, I'm going to end the fixed income and RAND discussion. And I'm going to hand over to Peter Armitage to talk us through the equity outlook. So I'm going to talk through global equities. I'm then going to hand over to uh, Mike Gresty, who's going to talk through um, local equities and try and give you some kind of perspective on how we see the world. I think trying to analyze <clears throat> where we're at, we have to look at what's happened. Um, a good benchmark for global equ equity 500, which is currently sitting at about 41,000, uh, 4,100. Now, that was um, 4,800 at the beginning of... Uh, 2022, uh, it started the year at about 3,800, and it's now about six or seven percent higher. So at index level, you've had a pretty decent return from uh, global equities for the year, but that's been very focused in a few shares, and it's really been the AI shares that have uh, that have kicked through. The um, the the median share on the S and P is actually down for the year, so I think the market has been pretty cautious about high interest rates. Nolan's, Nolan's talked you through where we sit, and um, they've been pricing in, you know, kind of the risks that come with high interest rates. When interest rates are so high, as Nolan indicated, some things break, um, and the market is pricing in a, a slowing of the economy. So looking forward through into the, the rest of the year, uh, the next 12 months, we're talking about a 7% odd return um, from, from global equities, which is fairly muted and below average. Um, but we do think longer term equities are the place to be. I think the um, you know the 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 return range of eight to ten percent in dollars over time is what is achieved. But we're currently wrestling through the economic cycle and seeing uh, how that flows through into equities. So to look at a few slides, to look at the facts, um, this is the MSCI World Forward PE multiple. So the price that you're paying um, for the companies that you're buying. And you can see that you're sitting at roughly above average. It's come off from the heady heights of uh, COVID. If we remember that earnings declined and the market raced up sharply after dropping. Um, and we're now sitting at kind of the average level uh, for the course of the last 10 years, but slightly above average if you look at the course of the last 15 years. So the biggest factor for equity markets is the underlying earnings growth. Obviously, if companies are growing, then shares do well. And you can see that going through into 2023, uh, what we're cur currently experiencing is negative earnings. A combination of high interest rates obviously puts pressure on company earnings together with a stronger dollar and higher oil prices. However, if we look forward through into 24 and 25, uh, we see earnings growth recovering as interest rates come down. Now, the risk and what people are pretty cautious about and has seen a 10% drop in the market over the course of the last six weeks or so is people believing that uh, th there's risk to the 2024 number. Um, because the economy has been so strong this year and um, the base has been pretty decent and the companies that have managed to pass on higher inflation levels um, have actually done pretty well. So a really mixed bag. The third quarter earnings, which are almost finished in the US, um, is above expectations. GDP growth is strong. Um, but we, we, we are seeing that result in a fairly hawkish Fed who indicating that rates might stay longer for higher, higher for longer. So our... Uh, in, in the context of what's available in the investment world, uh, the starting point is the U.S. government bond. And as Nolan indicated, that's around 5%. You can put your money in the J.P. Morgan money market fund and earn 5.2% without risk. Uh, and really, everything has to be compared to that. 
So we've got a neutral view on equities. Uh, we would be looking for, uh, for um, we'd be looking for kind of more compensation to take equity risk. And that's what's shown in this chart here. So the equity risk premium is effectively the, the premium that you get on equities over bonds. Now, the U.S. 10-year government bond yield is considered the ultimate risk-free asset in the world because the U.S. government can always pay you back. They can pay back your money. You can currently get 5% on that. So in order to take equity risk, um, it makes sense that you get a higher yield in equities. So to explain that in very simple terms, if a share price is $100 and a company earns $5, that's a 5% yield on the $100 and a 20 times P multiple, which is the 100 divided by the five. Now, over time, the equity risk premium has generally been between three and 5%. In other words, the yield that you get when you buy a share is uh, three to 5% ahead of the yield that you get on bonds. And as you can see on this chart, um, that's come down right all the way down to 1%. So equities relative to bonds look pretty expensive. We do think bond yields will come off a bit, it doesn't mean that equities have to plummet, but you're not really being rewarded for the additional risk that you're taking in equities at the moment. And, uh, you know, hence we've got a fairly neutral view in the equity space. We wouldn't, however, be bailing out on our equities, um, you know, given that a lot of the companies have actually, you know, haven't done that well this year. Um, the median share is down. And, uh, uh, you know, one never knows when the equity market kicks up. And trying to time and be in and out of the market is generally not a very profitable strategy. I'm now going to talk through um, three companies which give a very good example of the kind of things we want to invest in, which have got some reasonable earnings growth and are not, not subject to the economic vagaries that we're talking about. So first of all, to talk through Boston Scientific, uh, Anchor's got uh, an approach where we place a premium on growth. We like to be invested in businesses that generate growth. And Boston Scientific is one of the top two or three medical device companies in the world, or rather medical technology. So if you picture anything that a, um, a, a doctor might use in surgery, cardiology, urology, um, all of the devices that are in the hospital room and the devices that they're putting into somebody, so pacemakers and the like as well. So this is a company which we think, um, this is just kind of a, a picture of the, the different products that it's got. And in addition to, um, as you can appreciate, medical technology is advancing rapidly. Um, so some pretty nice growth. Um, and organically, we think this business can grow at 8 to 10%. And in addition to that, they've, they, they've embarked on what they call in tuck-in merger and acquisition. So smaller businesses, and obviously they've got the distribution force and ability to sell products throughout the medical space. So you've got a company which uh, we think can grow turnover at about 8 to 10% can grow profits at 15% at the bottom line level and is sitting just above the 20, 20 times PE multiple. And that's really what we're looking for in Anchor, in our portfolios. Um, and if a company can grow at 15% per annum on a compound basis, a really nice equation, a business that's proved itself, it's an $80 billion business. Uh, and as you'd, as you'd appreciate, this is not really subject to the vagaries of the economic cycle. So that's an example of one of the shares included in our portfolios. Another share which has very little to do with the economic cycle, which we really like, is the cybersecurity space. And our favorite share here is Fortinet. It's the second biggest pure play cybersecurity company in the world. And th this industry and these businesses have been growing their turnovers in excess of 25% for the last few years. Uh, and we think they can continue at those kind of levels. The picture that I've got on the left-hand side here is the percentage of IT projects most and least likely to get cut. Um, so this is a survey across uh, the CIOs of the big companies in America, and they've said, if you were to cut expenditure, where would you cut? And you can see at the top, security software, and particularly with the advance of AI and the increased risks that come from a cybersecurity perspective, um, it's the least, li least likely sector to get cut. So Fortinet is... Uh, is a very high quality business. If you look at the free cash flows, it's in the top 10% of S&P 500 companies. Uh, free cash flow margin in excess of 35%. Uh, the chart at the top here indicates that it you know, doesn't dilute away its earnings and share options as many of the other companies do. 
And this is a company where we think it can sustain earnings growth well in excess of 20% for many years to come. Again, not subject to the vagaries of the economic markets uh, and economic conditions. And this, uh, you know, the earnings growth we think will be sound regardless of what happens in economic conditions. Um, this kind of growth you don't get cheaply, uh, but it's uh, now sitting at about a 435 multiple. And all of the, the steam and overvaluation that came through in the market over the course of the last uh, the last few years, um, the kind of hot air has come out of it and you back down to a reasonable valuation. A third company that we think has very little to do with the economic cycle is Admiral. It's a company that we've we bought and sold in our business quite a few times over the course of the last 12 years. A very high quality UK car insurance business. I think you could compare it to uh, our insurance in the South African context. Uh, they operate at about a 50% return in equity. Uh, and they've got very good disciplines in terms of the, the excess cash that they generate gets paid out as a dividend. So a very nice dividend yield on the company and a very reasonable valuation. Now, the insurance companies work in cycles. As you will appreciate, um, the cost of repairing vehicles and the like um, went up significantly with inflation and everything that we've experienced in the globe over the course of the last few years. And insurance premiums tend to lag. So the industry went through a negative period, uh, but it started to reprice quite significantly. And the chart on the right-hand side shows two independent surveys to show um, what's happening to insurance premiums in the market. So we think the cycle is now at a very positive time. Um, the market is kind of starting to reprice insurance premiums, and uh, the margin will come back pretty strongly. Uh, Admiral is the largest UK car insurer. And uh, we don't just look at financial metrics. I think what's very important is this company consistently wins lots of awards for best workplaces in Europe and a very positive and motivated um, workforce. We visited their premises in the UK. And uh, it's a company which, you know, kind of always wins the awards in terms of customer service and the like. So in a market that's improving, um, high dividend yield, great company. It's another example of the kind of business that we're talking about. So, uh, you know, what we try to illustrate is you can go and find businesses that are reasonably priced, that are good, good earnings prospects, not subject to what happens to the economy. And you can invest in a, in a portfolio. You know, the kind of underlying growth of these companies is in the region of 15 to 20%. Uh, and, and equity should always form part of that, uh, that equation. The overall market, um, we're a little bit more cautious on, um, given the uncertainties uh, as a result of higher interest rates. So let me hand over to Mark Gresty, who's now going to talk through the local markets. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can see those. So I'm going to quickly take you through the SA Equity Outlook. Um, and first of all, I think this is a slide that if you've seen anybody's uh, views on SA equities, you'll be familiar with this. So, you know, generally we start off with this view that South African equities look cheap. Now, I put two question marks next to that because I would say the correct interpretation is more that SA equities are lowly rated. That's not necessarily cheap uh, versus their history. And whether you look at them in absolute terms, as we've done on the left-hand side there, um, or relative to certainly the postcode of, uh, for South African equities, which is more the, the emerging market uh, universe, no denying very cheap relative to their histories. But the question mark uh, there suggests, you know, is that appropriate and where to from here? Um, now, the way I feel about South African equities at the moment is it feels a little bit like waiting for Goddard. And some of you out there who probably didn't focus too much on the arts through your Academic studies will probably be saying, well, who the hell has got it? So um, essentially, got it as a play. Waiting for got it as a play um, where two guys are meet up and they're waiting for this, this character called got it to arrive. And it's essentially the discussions that they have and the various other people that come along while they're waiting for this person to arrive. Um, and for those that know this play, you'll be aware that, in fact, uh, got it never really does arrive. Uh, and that's the, the story of that. Now, essentially, SA equities have uh, felt like that for some time. Value has appeared pretty attractive, but there have always been a bunch of good reasons why, uh, you know, that big ripping rally that so many of us have been hoping for simply hasn't materialized. And we find ourselves very much in that situation right now. A long list of 
headwinds. Um, you know, Pete was talking just now, and I'm glad he was the one that had to explain the, what cost of capital is and how it works. But, you know, I'm going to show you just now that South African cost of capital is very high at the moment. And that's a tremendous headwind to the sort of valuations you can justify. And frankly, when you're earning a yield of 12% plus in bonds with relatively secure um, certainty around that uh, and the variability of returns from South African equities, you're demanding a big premium to be, to be in SA equities. The next thing... Um, you know, so in recently earnings has not been coming to the to the rescue in South Africa. So there have been a number of companies where we've seen big profit warnings and disappointments. And there's a list of companies which have perhaps been most exposed to some of the frailties and challenges in South Africa over the last while. Transaction Capital, Pick and Pay, Tiger Brands, Astral, all really struggling in recent times. And the share prices have reacted accordingly. Most of your miners are in a downgrade from a from an earnings perspective, as we've seen commodity prices come off. Um, and then, you know, as we look further forward, DM develop market recession fears and, you know, frustratingly ambiguous uh, uh, policy around China and, you know, the long expected stimulus that we were hoping for simply hasn't really materialized. And that's really important for the South African market. And then finally, just simply a lack of appetite for South African equities. We've seen local fund managers going to their full allocation offshore, foreign investors, given all the issues we've been facing, generally are not looking at SA at the moment. And obviously, when one thinks about the prospects for a re-rating and a recovery in equities, you really need to have faith that some new money is going to flow into our market. So I don't think any of those issues are going to come as a tremendous surprise to any of you out there. Um, you know, I think the appeal, though, is that you know, 12 months forward, if our stars align, you really could get a scenario in which um, a very different picture emerges. You could imagine a situation where bond yields are receding, so that cost of equity pressure uh, begins to to ease off. Uh, we're already hearing talk, particularly on the ESCOM side, that a year out, the impact of load shedding is going to be much more moderate. We're hearing of privatization potentially in Transnet. And you can really envisage a scenario where these binding constraints start to ease. And then finally, you know, if we see China beginning to step up uh, it's stimulus measures over the next year or so, very positive for South Africa. So yes, no doubt there's a, a silver lining potentially. And how do we think about that in the context of SA equities? The reality is that tends to cause one, if you're wanting to play that, to get into the cheapest, most beaten up shares where you perceive the upside is likely to be the greatest. And there we're a little cautious. You know, what we would argue is, frankly, time is not on the side of poor businesses. You get it right. And undoubtedly, you can make great returns. I think we saw an element of that uh, back in what we called the Ramaphoria rally, rally in 2018, uh, when really the most depressed companies gave you the best returns. And we're certainly vigilant for those, you know, those stars aligning, um, starting to appear. But we need to see more evidence of that uh, before we are in, we are prepared to invest behind it, because we don't believe that time is on the side of these poorer companies. Um, so for the time being, we're a little cautious and we're urging investors to stick to quality, stick to companies in this uncertain environment where you have a lot of confidence around their ability to um, deliver you earnings growth. And as Pete did with a couple of international examples, I'm going to give you a few suggestions just now um, of a few companies that we think under kind of any weather are relatively secure places to be positioned in which are the type of companies we think should be the real bedrock and pillar of your portfolio at the moment. So just on the issue of cost of capital before we get there, um, you know, what you're seeing is because of the very high bond yields, and Pete explained how, you know, when you think about the return you need from equities, you start off with your bond yield, which you see as your relatively secure return. That's sitting at about 12%. And then you need a risk premium on top of that to uh, essentially give you the reason to go into equities. And at the moment, when you add the risk premium on top of South African bond yields, you find that our cost of capital is the highest that it's been in 20 years. And that really means the sort of multiple you can justify or the valuation you can justify for South African equities is you know, certainly much depressed relative to history. And it's important to keep that in context when you think purely of what appear, as we saw at the beginning, to be relatively low valuations on South African equities. And then one of the other points that we raised 
um, was just the importance of China in the context of South Africa. And I thought this was a really interesting piece of analysis that Morgan Stanley did, uh, where they show uh, the relationship, or what we call the beta of, of various markets around the world uh, to China. And essentially, that's talking about the degree to which markets move together. So the lower your beta, uh, essentially what that means is the lower the relationship between how Chinese equities in this case uh, move um, and how that particular market moves. And you can see um, outside of Hong Kong, where the relationship between China and Hong Kong from a listed equities perspective should be pretty self-evident, across the world, South Africa is the next most related market to China. So very hard to see how South African equities could perform without there being a much clearer um, upward move in, in Chinese equities. And this is obviously, as I mentioned earlier on, been a big source of frustration. So with all of these frustrations and uncertainty, where can one look to uh, potentially find safety? Uh, one example, first of all, it's a company we've liked for a long time, Advertech. It's one of the opportunities in the private education space in South Africa. This is a space that um, certainly struggled quite a bit through COVID. Uh, it was perhaps, in, in retrospect, uh, an obvious call that COVID would be a a challenge for them, but I think all of the companies in this space have emerged better for the cleanup that occurred during COVID. On the left-hand side, there you can you can see a couple of factors around uh, you know what the broader schools opportunity looks like, South African schools, and you can see that on the top left-hand side there, the number of pro uh, government schools has actually been declining over the last couple of decades. While on the flip side, the lower chart there showing the number of students enrolled in those uh, government schools has been steadily increasing. Um, and you can see how small, despite growth that's occurred in the private space, uh, the number of uh, students are relative to the broader market. So still a tremendously significant opportunity for private uh, school education providers. And then if you change gears and have a look at the tertiary picture, you can see the steadily rising number of students uh, essentially looking for places in higher education. Um, and essentially, the lack of increase in capacity has meant that the shortfall has been steadily increasing. Again, talking to the sort of structural growth opportunity that you have, despite obviously a very cha challenging macro environment in South Africa within the private education space. And for that, uh, you're looking at a company here trading on a forward price earnings multiple of about 10 times where you have pretty secure earnings growth of around 24% over the next three years compound. You know, very cash generative business, uh, decent balance sheet, not too much debt. So I think a very secure place to be irrespective of what happens over the next couple of years from an SA macro perspective. Another of our favorites, in fact, they reported results last week, is Afrimat. They like to show this chart on the left-hand side, which shows how their earnings have grown versus uh, as a result of acquisitions that they've made, which has transitioned this business very successfully from a pretty stodgy construction materials business into a mid-sized diversified miner. They show there what the earnings has done as a result of that strategy. And over the last little while, we've seen a whole host of new um, acquisitions and projects that uh, Afrimat has su successfully secured. So they're kind of in the base now, and they're busy um, bringing those projects to production. And you're going to see those earnings um, start to come through very meaningfully over the next couple of years. And you can see those colored parts on the bars on the right-hand side, just showing how that new production uh, and new exposure really gives you a kick to earnings. Now, you could argue, well, goodness me, this is a company that, um, you know, it's essentially a call on where commodity prices go, and we're very uncertain about that. I think that's a fair point. But that what I've shown here on the left-hand side is what Afrimat, which is the red line there, what its future earnings profile looks like over the next couple of years versus a whole bunch of other mining companies. And you can see, first of all, that you know, there's already a pretty somber picture if you consider what the outlook for mining earnings over the next couple of years is. Um, and so certainly from a commodity price perspective, there's not great excitement in terms of what's uh, in Afrimat's earnings, but you get a very different profile purely as a result of all that nice acquisitive new project um, growth coming through over the next couple of years. It's a business on a relatively low rating, 
Again, a nice strong balance sheet um, and potentially an attractive dividend yield. So it's really the, the differentiation you get. Yes, cyclical mining, but a very different kind of miner in the form of Afrimat. And then finally, let's say this is probably a bit of an unexpected one for you, Standard Bank. So Standard Bank, you know, pre-2010 was probably the preeminent banking story in South Africa. It went through what I would call somewhat of a lost decade, mainly as a result of a you know, huge problem that they had with a, a SAP implementation, you know, big overruns and delays in implementing new IT projects. Africa was a bit up and down for them, a lot of capital stuck in Africa, and then this loss-making ICBC uh, joint venture that they had in Europe. And essentially, Standard Bank has now emerged from all of those issues. Uh, it's now starting to gain market share in retail. It's sorted out its IT issues. Its African operations are now a really important differentiator for it. And all of this on a relatively un undemanding rating, nice dividend yield, high return on, on equity. And, you know, I think it's returned to the Standard Bank of old. It's got its tail up. Um, and, you know, your big differentiator is really that African uh, uh, franchise that it has, which is now about 45% of earnings. And you can see here that if you look at the color coding there, it's really where a lot of the strength in terms of activity, uh, particularly from an investment banking perspective, is happening, um, which is really augmenting the, can I say, more modest growth prospects that we're seeing in South Africa. So, again, uh, you know, I think a business that because of its diversity, um, of operations presents a nice, attractive, relatively secure earnings story. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Pete to just sum things up. Well, so Nolan's gone through fixed income markets. And I think the I was saying to somebody the other day, um, Anchor's been around for about 12 years now. And literally for the first time in those 12 years, we put uh, US government bonds into somebody's portfolio. And uh, the outlook for that from a risk reward perspective looks pretty attractive. So the equity outlook and kind of the neutral view on equities is a function of both the absolute returns, but also the, the alternatives that are out there at the moment. So to sum up our equity outlook, um, SA equities, we're saying a 12% return over the course of the next year, which isn't bad. Um, but, you know, you can get that 12% in bonds with much lower risk. From a global equity perspective, 7% US dollar return. Uh, but I think, you know, that you, you do want to re remain invested. I think as we pointed out, the uh, the earnings outlook uh, as interest rates come down and the cycle moves along uh, the, the path, um, you know, there will be a fairly nice equation there. So if we pull it together, um, domestically, equity is 12%, globally, global equity 7%, um, and we're sitting neutral in equities uh, with a much more positive view from a uh, from a credit and government bond perspective. I think also just to talk about alternatives, so those are assets which typically aren't daily priced, um, structured products, property, hedge funds, the like. Uh, we do think there's some really nice opportunities there to get kind of 10 to 15% returns. Anchor over the course of the last year has launched various alternative products and uh, for financial advisors and wealth managers that certainly should form anywhere between 10 and 30% of client portfolios. So that's the um, that's the kind of outlook over the course of the next 12 months. We're now going to, um, to have two very interesting presentations from Sileo and James. Um, Sileo is going to start off uh, in talking about stock market returns. Done some very interesting work in that space. And uh, over to you, Sileo. Thank you, Pete. Yes, so we had a look at stock market returns recently and the nature of the history of, of those returns. And what we found was counterintuitive enough for us to write about in the Navigator and present on here today. So typically, investors tend to think of stock market returns as being as follows. Uh, we tend to think that the majority of stocks have returns that are somewhere close to average or the market return. For example, in the US, we might think of this return as being around 8 to 10%. Uh, typically, we then think there's a small number of what we would term market darlings. These are stocks that over time do something around 30 to 40% over the long term. So really exceptional stocks, a small uh, proportion of the index. And then you also have uh, on the other, the other side of the distribution, a small number of stocks that are exceptionally negative. So over time, their returns might be flat to negative. Um, and we think of these as laggards. So this is how investors tend to think of uh, stock market returns. Uh, 
But when you actually have a look at the data, what you find is uh, the market behaves as follows. So the majority of, of stocks actually produce flat to negative returns. So they are poor performance. You then have a very small proportion of stocks within an index that are significant outperformers. And it's really that small number of, of outperformers or exceptional stocks that drive forward returns for an index such as the S&P 500, for example. Now, this is something that we're all familiar with when we think about investing in startups, for example, or early stage businesses. We're comfortable and we understand the idea that the majority of those investments are going to go to zero. And it's only, only going to be a small number of those early stage investments that do exceptionally well. So things like Instagram, where it's uh, an early stage investment in that company obviously would have had exceptional financial returns. But we understand that for the majority of early stage investments, those are going to go to zero. And this is what we find when you look at the data. So, for example, one study looked at U.S. venture returns from 20, 2004 to 2013, and they found that 64.8%, so nearly two-thirds of those early-stage investments uh, were negative, so they lost money. Uh, some did okay, and it was really a small number, about 1.5% of those early-stage investments that had exceptional returns. In this case, those investments returned between 20 to 50 or even more than 50 times the original investment. Now, again, this is something I think uh, even coming into this presentation, we're all, under, we're all comfortable with that idea that a small number of uh, early stage investments will do well, but the majority will, will be flat to negative. But what's really surprising is that if you look at stock market returns, so public equities, uh, you find that there's a similar distribution or pattern in terms of returns for stock markets. So a very interesting study was done between 1926 and 2016, so that's 90 years, where an economist looked at about 26,000 companies in the U.S. Uh, over that period and analyzed the returns that those companies or stocks uh, produced. And he found something similar to what we've just been talking about. So in this case, he found that about... 1,092 of those 26,000 companies, so that's 4% of those companies, uh, produced 100% of the net wealth that was created over the 90 years in the U.S. stock market. So again, a very small proportion uh, producing the majority of returns. And what's fascinating is that uh, the remaining 96% collectively matched treasury bills. So they had pretty subpar or disappointing performance. It gets even more interesting when you zoom in a little bit more. So if you look at 90 of those, uh, the top 90 performing of those 26,000 uh, companies, uh, you find that that 0.3% uh, of those companies or those 90 com companies accounted for half. So we're talking 50% of the, the net wealth that was created over the 90 years. Just for context, uh, about 30, $35 trillion was created over that 90 years in terms of uh, net wealth. And just 90 sto uh, stocks over that period accounted for half of that. And what gets, uh, what's even more interesting is if you zoom in a bit more, you find that just five of those 26,000 companies, so now we're talking 0.02% of those companies, accounted for 10% of the wealth that was created over the 90 years. So you can almost think of this as being uh, like uh, grains of sand on a beach. Uh, throughout the whole beach, only you know five grains of sand accounted for roughly 10% of the value of, of the whole beach. Um, and so, again, you're seeing this really uh, lopsided distribution in terms of uh, returns historically. But it's not just the, we don't just find that a small proportion of, of stocks do exceptionally well. We also find that in public equity markets, the majority of stocks actually have sub, uh, substandard or poor performance. So uh, in that study, they found that more than half of the 26,000 stocks had negative returns over the over their lifetime, so over the time that they were listed on whichever exchange they were on. And we found that the most frequent lifetime return when you rounding to the nearest 5% was actually 0%. So the majority of these stocks actually had very sub substandard or poor performance, and it was just that small group that did very well. Now, that was one study, but there are several studies that have found something similar to this. So uh, a study was done on the Russell 3000, 
Russell 3000 we can think of as being similar to the S&P 500, except rather than looking at the 500 biggest stocks, it looks at the 3000 biggest stocks. They found that just 7% of the stocks in that index generated essentially all of that index's returns from 1980 to 2014. So again, something similar to what we've been discussing. And I think that's all good and well when you look at uh, what's happened historically. But the question, of course, is how do you apply this or how do we uh, view today's market through that lens in terms of what we've just been discussing? Well, today we have what's been called the Magnificent Seven. So these are seven companies that are all U.S. Uh, based, U.S. listed and based. They're all large cap companies. They're all technology companies. And they've all done exceptionally well in terms of stock market performance uh, in 2023. So they've really driven markets forward substantially. To put, uh, to put some numbers behind that, if you had taken a portfolio of those seven stocks, the so-called Magnificent Seven, and equal weighted them in a portfolio, uh, you, you would have been up, you would be up close to 100% year to date uh, in dollars. Whereas the S&P 500 year to date is only up close to 10%. And obviously that S&P 500 includes the Magnificent Seven. So if you were to take those seven out, the performance of the index would uh, look substantially worse. So what's interesting here is that, again, you have a situation where a small group of, stock, of stocks is really driving the performance of a much larger index, similar to what we saw in some of those studies. Now, having said that, I, I definitely don't want to give the impression that we're saying we are bullish uh, uniformly on all seven of those stocks or that we, we have a uniform uh, view on all seven of those stocks. Um, we, As a house, we definitely look at and research all seven stocks and at different points uh, in different portfolios, we have owned the majority of those stocks. But uh, it's this is not a, a blanket, uh, I suppose, approval for, for all seven stocks from here going forward in terms of our performance. And perhaps you could argue that things have swung a bit more to the extreme side in terms of the outperformance of those seven stocks relative to the rest of the market. So as of the end of July of this year, those seven stocks represented close to 30% of the S&P 500. If you were to go back over time, you would find that you would have to go back more than 100 years to find um, another period where the top seven stocks in the S&P 500 were, were at the level that they were at at the end of July. Um, having said that, we again, we have differing views on those seven stocks, but really the point that we want to make by showing the our performance of the Magnificent Seven is just to reiterate that it's actually not that unusual for a small group of stocks in an index to drive the returns of those in, of that index uh, over time. That's actually quite consistent with what you find when you look at, at data historically. And so I think what one of the takeaways we can uh, take from these studies is that when you find a company that you that you can identify as being exceptional, it often pays to hold on to that company and to be essentially an optimist or, or uh, to be a bull on that company as long as the data continues to support that view. Uh, and so our colleague James Bennett has done some work looking at the benefits of, of being an optimist um, in stocks. And so he's going to discuss some of his findings on that. Now. I'll pass it on to James. Good, right there. I'll, uh, I'll start with my piece. So um, I wrote the short piece for The Navigator just on something I feel very strongly about about when it comes to investing, why it pays to be um, an optimist um, in, in, in the long run. Okay, so just to clarify up front, I think when we talk about being an optimist, it doesn't mean that you just blindly invest in you know every hot idea that comes across your desk. Um, it's not that you believe that markets only ever go up on a weekly, monthly, quarterly and, and yearly basis. It just means that you've got this overriding view that in the long run, despite all the worries and concerns that the markets have, markets seem to find a way of generally growing through those issues and coming out on top um, in, in the long term. Now, it's always important to understand that uh, where the you know where the press is coming from there's always this natural bias with the press to uh, focus on uh, negative news because obviously that's what what sells you know there's that old saying in the press world that if it bleeds it leads um and so if one goes into these things with a somewhat pessimistic view of the world you're going to get fed 
a constant source of information on a daily basis, uh, uh, you know, reinforcing those those negative views of the world. And it's probably going to lead to to worse outcomes on your investing um, in the longer term. I mean, what what we don't see from the press every day is these kinds of headlines, you know, imploring people to, you know, hold on to their share portfolios for steady compounding gains over the next 20 years, because obviously that's not what... Uh, what what sells in in the press world, and again now now being an optimist doesn't mean that you think that nothing can ever go wrong. And it's true to say that you know just about anything theoretically can go wrong with, with the world we're living. Uh, I think the point is you can't forecast these things, and even if these ap- apocalyptic things uh, you know views come true. At the time, there's probably not much you're going to be able to do about it anyway. But a, a long-term optimist just believes that you know humanity has shown a very resourceful way to get around a lot of these issues and has found a way to work through them. And that you know, if you maintain an optimistic view over the longer term, you're probably likely to get um, a, a better outcome over time. So here's the way I would look at these things from an investing perspective. Well, in the short term there, you probably do just want to be a pessimist. Uh, always keep your expectations anchored extremely low about short-term outcomes. If you're buying a share that's fallen quite a bit, you wait and you wait, and then you wait a little bit more, and then you buy it. The chances are it's probably still going to fall even more in the short term. If the market falls and you think you're catching the bottom, you're probably going to be disappointed, and it's probably going to fall even a little bit further. But it certainly helps to keep one's expectations extremely low in terms of short-term possible outcomes. In the medium term, there you probably just want to be a realist, and there you'll probably find that you know, some things will work out in your portfolio, other things won't. Sometimes the shares you expected the most from are the ones that end up disappointing you. Uh, the shares that you expect the, the least from are sometimes the ones that actually surprise you most uh, on the upside. But in the long term, you really just want to have an optimistic stance and believe that um, you know society and humanity really has just shown a way to work through these issues. Um, and often the things that we worry about, we look back 5, 10, 15 years later, and these things are nothing more than just blips on the long-term charts. And we sort of look back and wonder why we worried about these things as much as, as we did. I mean, here's just a very simple chart. Uh, It's on a log scale so that it puts everything into a nice uh, sort of percentage uh, perspective just on how the S&P 500 has done going back to the 1940s. And probably for most of the people on this call, this is pretty much, uh, you know, their investing lifetime. And if we think back of all the things we could have worried about during this time, uh, you know, very, very real issues that that were proper issues at the time, Uh, you know, the Cold War. Uh, you had the you know the rampant US inflation of the 1970s um, you know you had the global financial crisis of 2008 you had the more recent covid crisis so it's not that there weren't some serious issues during this time but certainly the market found a way generally to work those through those those issues uh, on a long term view now now this is not to to sort of knock the press um, they perform a very vital role uh, uh, in financial markets but always to remember that the press lives in the moment and that tomorrow's moment is is going to be different uh, from today's moment. Now, even myself, I had an interesting incident recently where I was watching a, a, a sort of a financial news panel of uh, you know smart guys uh, expressing their concerns about the market. And as I was watching this, I thought, wow, these guys have got it pretty spot on. It's all pretty topical. Uh, they were talking about inflation. The market was falling sharply that day. There was a, a lot of panic. They were worried about big tech valuations. They were worried about market earnings. And suddenly about halfway through the uh, the, the the clip, I suddenly realized I was actually watching something from about five years ago. And I think it, it is actually quite instructive to sometimes, if you've got a little bit of time, just go and watch some of these old business clips from a few years ago. Um, and you just realize that the concerns never really change. Um, you know, all the things that we are worried about today, many of these things are things that people were worried about five um, and 10 years ago. And, and it's certainly instructive to do that. I was watching a very good uh, interview with a, a good UK fund manager, a guy called Nick Train. 
Um, it was an interview uh, he did in in the recent past. Uh, he's one of the founders of Lindsay Train. He runs the big uh, Finsbury Growth and, and Income uh, Trust as well. And obviously, he meant this slightly tongue in cheek, but where he said, you know, I would rather give my money to a foolish optimist than a wise pessimist for the optimist has history on their side. And I think, you know, that is something that is is very true broadly for markets in the long term as well. There, there's this very strange thing with, with markets as well is that bearish people always just sound more knowledgeable and wise than bullish commentators. Um, whereas the bullish guys, you know, kind of always sound like they're a little bit gullible, inexperienced. You know, the guy that always comes on every day says he thinks the market's going up. And yet, you know, contrary to, you know, the long-term uh, you know, thesis of of investing in shares is that the bullish guys do actually have the history on their side. Is that markets generally do rise over the long term and and actually you know beat inflation, which is obviously you know enemy number one when it comes to to long term investing. So yes, keeping an optimistic stance probably does give you the chance of of a better outcome. And I would also make the point as well is that many of the high business achievers that we can you look at globally over time you know didn't get there by taking a pessimistic stance and there's this really good quote that Elon Musk gave about Charlie Munger now again this is not to knock Charlie Munger one of the world's you know great investing minds but um, there was a lunch in 2009 uh, that Musk attended with Munger. There were a whole lot of other people as well. And as he says here in the quote, uh, you know, Munger went into some detail explaining to everybody around the table all the ways that he thought Tesla would fail. Uh, Musk actually went to him afterwards and said, look, you know, I agree with all of these uh, things you've given. We probably are going to die. Uh, but it's probably worth trying anyway. And of course, the rest is history. And we know where Tesla is today. Now, I think if, if I was starting a business and, and I went and sat at a lunch and uh, an incredible investment mind like Charlie Munger told everybody around the table how my business would fail, I think I would have probably just closed up shop the next day. But although it's not the only ingredient to success, there's absolutely no doubt that an element of, of kind of long-term optimism, just believing that things are going to work out in the long run, holds all of these kinds of very successful people um, in in very good stead, and then just wrapping it up on on my side before I hand it back uh, to Pete. You know, people often when you know looking at their own long term investments and look at all the what if scenarios about this could go wrong and that go wrong. And what I always say is is that no one can financially plan for World War Three. There, there's always an apocalyptic outcome on or view on the world that whether you've got you know the proverbial cash under the mattress. Um, a, a deep value fund, uh, an index fund, or a growth strategy, probably none of those things are really going to save you uh, in a really sort of draconian type of outcome. But I think instead, the best chance one has with your long-term investments is taking just an optimistic view. Yes, there's a lot of issues in the world today. There'll be a whole lot of new issues in the world tomorrow. But the best chance you have is just taking this long-term view that in the long run, things probably will kind of work out okay. And that's it from my side, and I'll hand back to uh, Pete at this point. Okay, fantastic, James. I think that's uh, some very interesting perspectives on the investing world out there. Um, we're going to have a bit of a Q&A session now. Um, if you would like to post a question, please do it under the Q&A as opposed to the chat function. Um, Nolan, perhaps if we can start with you. Um, are we seeing meaningful progress in South Africa's effort to get off the grey list? And then uh, just another question uh, on SA bonds versus global bonds. Uh, Alexander Day says, I find it interesting that you find global bonds more attractive than SA bonds, but given your outlook of moderate growth in the US and unwinding interest rates, do you think this will be long lived? So perhaps if you could grab those two. Sure, two very, very different questions, hi Pete. Um, let's start with a grey listing question. And sadly, not enough action, I think, is the message I'd give. We, we are seeing some pronouncements from the government that they've ticked seven of 14 boxes or whatever, but it's, it's very much a tick box exercise at this stage. I think the reality is that you know, if we delve into it, South Africa recently ranked seventh in the world amongst the 
countries for the worst organized crime. That's fundamentally what the problem is. And we need to address that. Um, you know, we can't, we can't be, um, you know, mm -hmm. having the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo and Nigeria next to us on that list. So I think until we address that, it's going to be difficult for South Africa to fully um, come off the gray list. In that context, well, I will say if, if I'm looking for a little bit of silver lining around the cloud is we did see SARS officials actually raid, um, you know, a couple of the people in Mapumalanga that are accused of being part of the sort of coal mafia, if I can put it that way. So we have seen a little bit of action, but like I was saying in my presentation, we need, we need to see meaningful prosecution. I think that's the key ingredient that we're waiting for. Um, coming to your second question, yes, South African bonds, global bonds. I think that the global bond environment in a year's time is more positive for everybody. I th just think that your propensity for capital gains globally is a little higher given some of the domestic issues that are going to hold South Africa back. Is this a long-term thing? No, I, th I very much am of the view, as, as we've been saying, that in the long run, equities tend to outperform bonds. But for the next 12 months or so, I do think that bond investments actually have a lot of appeal while, you know, we work through this part of the economic cycle. Yeah, I think just to try and understand the maths. So if you buy a US 10-year government bond, um, you're getting about just under 5% at the moment. Uh, remembering those bond yields were down around the 1% level if you look back uh, a year or two ago. And as inflation cools and rates come back down again, uh, if that 5% goes to 3.75%, which is our base case projection, and that gives you the 5% plus another 5% in capital appreciation. So that's about a 10% return in dollars. And if it comes down to 2.75, which is the projection of some market commentators out there, uh, you get another 10% on top of your 5%. So depending on the different scenarios and you know, if things do really start to slow down and there is some economic pressure, which would put pressure on equities, you'd like to see bond yields come down. Um, so for, to get a negative return out of those government bond yields, you'd need to see the, the yield kick up beyond 5.5%. So, you know, it's not, not ridiculously high returns, but from a risk return perspective, in terms of protection in the portfolio, we think that looks pretty good. Um, Saleo, there's a few questions. I think the coronation had some headlines recently talking about the platinum sector and indicating that it was uninvestable. I think we've been fairly negative on it for, for some time. Um, you know, just uh, are your and Anchor's views on the platinum sector and the you know, shares have come off significantly. Time to invest or do we avoid it completely? Uh, thanks, Pete. Yeah, so I don't think we would use the word uninvestable. Um something that I think you need to continually have a uh, re-evaluation of. Having said that, we are quite negative on the PGM sector. We still think that there's a dis disconnect between where share prices are and where the, the platinum group metal basket is. So where the, pl the prices of platinum, rhodium and palladium are, uh, there's still quite a big disconnect between that. And then we also think that there is uh, a bit too much optimism in consensus earnings. So going into the next set of uh, reporting or results in February next year, we think that there's going to be quite a bit of disappointment still, despite the fact that share prices are down, in some cases, 50 to 60%. And we need to keep in mind that the, this basket price that we have today is not that unreasonable or bearish. It's actually higher in both dollar terms and rand terms versus uh, 2019. So 2020 and 2021 were just uh, phenomenally uh, unusually strong periods for the PGM basket price. And we've just come back down to earth, if we, if we can call it that. But to summarize, we still think there's a disconnect in terms of share prices and earnings uh, or earnings power. Um, and so we would be sellers or staying on the sideline for PGMs. Thanks, Adil. Um, Quite an interesting question here, the, all the geopolitical risks and all the wars that are currently on the go. Um, are we buying any of the shares that are impacted by them positively or negatively and how are they are performing? Uh, Mark, that's a bit of a landing you in the hot seat there, but maybe just a, just some perspective on how we pick our offshore shares and whether factors like that uh, come into it. Yeah, so it's a great question. And, and uh, you know, I think in, in retrospect, there was probably an opportunity there uh, going back in time. But, you know, does one 
invest today. I think it's become already quite a hot theme. Um, you know, this idea of investing in defense and increased spend going forward. However, I have to admit that a lot of the research that I'm, I'm seeing is actually quite, is, is strangely quite cautious about the, the defense sector and, you know, really sort of pouring cold water on the theme to some extent because of the fact that it is so linked, you know, in the final analysis to sort of world, uh, you know, the relevant countries' GDP growth. Um, and, and, you know, you've already seen quite a strong push in those shares as a result of investors obviously jumping on board. And there's nothing like a rising share price to cause people to think they're on to a, you know, a winner without necessarily doing a hell of a lot of the fundamental work. So, you know, I think the, I, w- I would just express a word of caution. I think that within the sector, there are some very specific companies um that that look interesting but you know there are a lot that i i feel have been sucked along uh more around the story uh which is you know understandable but they're not quite as good quality and that's an important point you know when you boil down to fundamentals what are the returns on capital these companies are generating you know do they have the sort of supply chain issues and the ability to ramp up production to the extent that um, investors expect. And, you know, some of the stuff I've seen, for example, is that the, dare I say it, the, you know, a lot of the U.S. Uh, defense businesses are almost like cottage industries, would you believe? Um, so m- maybe a tougher theme than, than people perceive. And you've got to be quite selective uh, and really understand uh, the ability of these companies to sort of benefit from, you know, what obviously at the moment looks like a, a, a hot theme, no doubt about it. I would also just add there as well, obviously, we mentioned Fortinet. Remember, that's the whole cybersecurity theme is a slightly off-label way of playing uh, the defense theme as well. Uh, Many of the bad actors in global cybersecurity are are state-sponsored. I mean, there's all the the usual suspects there. So that's one way of playing it, but without all the moral issues around killing and machinery and that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's something to bear in mind. And then, uh, you know, an interesting question related to Sileo's uh, analysis of how concentrated market returns are is, uh, doesn't that just mean we should be investing in indexes to try and capture them? Sileo, maybe you want to have a go at that. Uh, James, maybe you want to add to it. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, that's one of the interesting things from that study is that people seems to be a, a Rorschach test and, or in those ink block tests in the sense that uh, this the what you take out of it depends on almost your your natural biases. So for some people, some people look at it and say, okay, this means we should probably index because it means we'll, although we won't be able to identify ahead of time what those outperforming stocks will be, we'll, we'll capture a small proportion of, of everything. And so we'll capture that. And then for other people, they they go into it, they see that study and they think, well, clearly this is this is a, a great um, this provides a lot of evidence that you should go active in the sense that you want to be able to identify and concentrate in in those outperformers. Uh, I think it really, if you look at, um, for example, the the Besson binder uh, test, so the old study, the the one that looked from 1926 to 2016. Uh, what's really interesting is that the large p- portion of those stocks that outperformed were really high quality or high return on capital businesses that had the ability to reinvest um, and had moats. So essentially quality companies. Um, and so I think that does suggest that there is an ability to identify uh, some of those stocks as a group ahead of time, because of course there's going to be hindsight bias. But I think it is interesting that uh, there were some common themes there. There were all high return on capital business, generally high margins, low levels of debt, things that uh, we tend to look for in in stocks, um, kind of in screening processes. But yes, I do think it was a bit of an ink block test, uh, that study. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I like Soleil's answer. I don't have to, uh, too much to add to that. But yeah, it's just that whole thing about you know risk profile. I think we can look back and say, with a little bit of luck, if you had caught just a couple of those uh, big tech stocks 20 years ago, uh, you know, you would have created absolutely generational wealth with that. But it also would have been extremely difficult to do. It's easy to say it now, 
to identify that very, very small handful of companies that came through and became the big ones amongst the the many hundreds that ended up f- failing in the end. So I guess if your risk profile is a bit lower and you you don't back yourself to have picked one of those very special ones, you could have kind of caught all of them, uh, but in a very diluted form uh, just by owning the index. Nolan, let's go back to you from a bond perspective. Um, the question saying, seeing that we're neutral on SA bonds, when would be a good time to pick up some SA bonds? And how should we think about fixed incomes and, and bond markets in the context of both US and SA elections next year? Thanks, Pete. Um, in terms of SA bonds, what, what I've said is the global bond environment gradually shifts to be more and more positive over the next 12 months. So it's kind of like, you know, we've spent three years swimming against the tide and it's been brutally difficult. But as the tide stops and then pushes us along, it gets easier. So from that perspective, I do think you want to own both domestic and foreign bonds. Domestic bonds, you've got a number of risk factors that you're going to need to get through. You've got the MTBPS in a couple of days' time. You've got a um, US um, Federal Reserve meeting. You've then got the South African MPC into January. We've got another MPC, and then we start thinking about elections. So you've got a myriad of risk factors that you know probably work out okay, but you've got to be cautious of. So domestic bonds, I think the view is at 1% a month returns. You do want to own these, but I would probably phase it in gradually over the next while. It's very difficult to call what each of those risk factors is going to do. But what I do know is I want to own probably more bonds in six months' time than I do right now, and and that's that's the approach we'd take. Looking at the elections, um, again, very big risk factors, um, very, very difficult to call. You know, is, is Trump going to be on the ballot or not? We actually don't know at this stage. Who's going to be up against Joe Biden? How's that going to play out? Very difficult to call. Domestically, how close is the ANC going to be to 50%? Um, who are they going to need to partner with in order to um, you know, secure them um, the presidency? And is, is that going to be the EMF? Um, not feeling like it at the moment, just kind of feeling like they should be able to cobble together alternate alliances, but one doesn't fully know. So from that perspective, you know, how are we investing? I think as as James was saying, you know, in the in the long term, I think this probably works out okay. Um, certainly offshore. Also, um, also domestically, I think the preponderance of outcomes are actually of decent outcomes for, for the bond markets. And it it's a case of, you know, being being optimistic about it, but sitting there with that red button to say, look, if things really do surprise us. This is how we're going to react and being ready for those scenarios, which which is the approach we're taking. Mark, uh, something we have to think about a lot is China. Um, you showed the correlation between the Chinese market and the South African market. From an SA perspective, Naspers Process, which is the biggest company by far in our market, is basically a Chinese business. And the resource companies are heavily influenced by Chinese demand. Um, how do we see the Chinese markets? And they've been a real dog this year. Investment plans have, have flowed out. Uh, is this an opportunity now? And, and how do we approach it? Yeah, Pete. So it, it, I think I mentioned in the in my my section of the presentation that it's been a hugely frustrating area of the world for us. You know, we certainly were positioned and remain positioned uh, for a bottoming and an improvement in the outlook for China. Um, you know, clearer policy direction. And frankly, you know, it just hasn't really materialized. So, you know, we've seen it continue to bump down. I think we still we still anticipate that this the this cycle is going to turn. Um, you know, we think that the underlying momentum among Chinese consumers is actually a lot better than the kind of broader investment sentiment would suggest. So there are pockets undoubtedly of challenge within China. Uh, but the you know, the particularly the consumer environment may not be recovering quite as quickly as some had hoped, but they, it is recovering nonetheless. We do think that in time we're going to see clearer policy direction in China. And as a result, we're certainly staying the course. Um, it has been a, a painful and lonely place to be. And I would say that, you know, we're, we're certainly not all in on China. And that's important to remain diverse, diversified. But it is one of the themes we are being patient on and do anticipate into you know, certainly next year that the investment climate will recover. 
So that's the way we remain positioned. And there's then a question which I'll pick up on uh, how are real assets holding up versus traditional asset class of the last three to five years? And why do most investors have such an underweight? The example given is the Yale Endowment. And I think the you know, increasingly around the world, a lot of people are increasing their exposure to alternatives. And alternatives is really the you know, very broad basket, which can cover lots of different assets, but typically includes property, hedge funds, uh, you know, kind of st- structural assets and, and things which usually private equity, stuff that isn't priced on a market on a daily basis and hence subject to massive volatility. I think the, the returns from real assets often have a lot to do with interest rates. So, you know, there's the components of real assets, which, which is interest yielding. Um, you know, it didn't give you much of a return over the course of the last 10 years. Nolan showed you those graphs of, of how low rates have been for quite some time. Um, but given that, you know, you can earn 5% on cash now, um, we, we're quite excited about real assets and we are increasing client exposure to alternative assets um, as we speak. We think, you know, it kind of makes sense to be somewhere between 10 and 30% of a portfolio, uh, depending on one, one's investment outlook. I think it, it does differ for, for different clients. I think the, you know, the big thing that one has to get one's head around with, with real assets is often liquidity. Um, we like to be able to move assets around at short notice uh, if opportunities arise. You know, if the stock market were to plummet by 20 or 30%, you want to have cash available and liquidity available to invest in it. So, you know, that's why we would limit. So so we've got a, you know, a, a, a range of real assets or alternative investments that we think can generate 10 to 15% uh, with relatively low volatility, which is kind of what everybody's looking for. But again, um, diversification is is an absolute non-negotiable. So, you know, the, the right proportion in those kind of assets make a lot of sense. Um, but I think that, you know, the, re- the reason, the question is why have investors generally been underweight? Uh, because often with things like private equity funds, you know, guys are asking people to lock up their money for, for long time periods. Um, Nolan, maybe if you can pick this up, the potential returns from both bonds and SA equity seem to be equal at plus 12. Does that mean you should equal weight? Or how do you make, um, you know, perhaps just to talk through the kind of premiums that one's looking for and how, how do you compare 12% with bonds versus 12% in equities? So historically speaking, we obviously um, view bonds as a lower risk asset class. So, you know, the way we'd look at it is you would look for equities to generate a return, you know, with a premium on top of what bonds can can produce in order to uh, justify the additional risk. So that's that's kind of the asset allocation starting point. Dig, digging into that, um, you know, we're, we're in a very unique situation in South Africa where, you know, if things do go right, if we do see earnings recovery, if we do see increased um, electricity production, et cetera, there is definitely some upside to equities. You don't want to totally miss out. So I definitely am not saying, you know, get out of SA equities. I think that there are some, some positive scenarios. However, on balance with the same sort of return expectations, the, you know, for bonds, it's just easier to get there. They've got to do less heavy lifting than equities in, in the near term. So we lean slightly towards equities, but it's not meaningful enough a difference that, that, you know, we've got to give a strong differential within our asset allocation. Um, so I thought it slightly to bonds, um, but not overly so. Mike, a uh, question on US banks. Um, you've covered the banking sector globally for, for many years. Um, the question, you know, if we think back to the beginning of the year, there's some bank failures. Um, the question says, I believe Bank of America is still sitting with considerable paper losses in U.S. treasuries. Um, you know, are banks globally an opportunity or should we be concerned about more bank failures and what are the implications of that? So the way I would think about that, Pete, I mean, there's certainly the banks are very lowly rated globally. Um, so in terms of their variability and cyclicality, I suppose that's to some degree reflected in their, in their, um, you know, in their ratings as they stand now. So I think if you envisage a scenario in which we're quite close to peak yields, um, and during the course of next year, we start to see yields easing, I think some of those concerns you have, um, that people are talking about in terms of mark to market losses in that remain embedded in, in, in banks really do begin to recede. So, you know, at the moment, it's certainly topical. Um, 
you know, remember that these banks are not trading in, in bonds. Um, and as a result, they don't necessarily mark those to market through their earnings. Um, and, you know, as a result, I, I personally think that this, that this issue is going to recede. Um, I think it's a bit overblown, but, you know, talking to some of the things that James raised about, you know, the Armageddon scenarios, of course, you know, if things turn out extremely negatively, we may be then talking about a, you know, a different outcome. But frankly, I, I think this is a little bit like fighting yesterday's war, to be honest. Um, and, you know, if one considers that these are held to maturity assets, um, you know, and in the, in the absence of government defaults and Armageddon, things like that, which we certainly, certainly don't see coming, um, I don't think it's a big issue. It, we, you know, what one's got to consider perhaps is the degree to which, you know, this can, in, in the case of smaller banks, uh, start to create a confidence issue among depositors and that kind of thing. And that's where, where the risk comes in, maybe, but it's not in and of itself, uh, the bonds, uh, and the sort of paper losses that appear there that particularly concern me and, and certainly not in the bigger name institutions, um, which you mentioned just now. So, you know, yesterday's war would be my sense. James, to ask you a que question about EVs, you did a very interesting Tesla presentation a few months back. Um, where, where, what's the current feeling? Germany's turned on mothballed coal powered fire stations. Uh, Rishi is extending petrol and diesel car usage. Um, you know, the whole sort of clean energy and EV argument. Mm. Uh, has, has that been delayed or what, what are your views on that? Yeah, I think probably the the world had just got a, a little bit ahead of itself on, on the whole EV, EV thing. Um, you know, there seems to be these ebbs and flows between EV and ICE. Obviously, ICE stands for uh, internal, you know, combustion engines or, or just the, uh, the conventional cars. So I, I think the the journey is still happening, but I just think some of the targets that some of the governments have, you know, were probably with hindsight just just too ambitious. Um, what we have seen this year as well is that there's a real price war going on between you know Tesla and the conventional ice transitioning to EV manufacturers like the the Germans and and the Americans. Um, and you know the big debate is well, how much of that is just because demand is a bit weak for EVs at the moment, and how much of this is Tesla basically just trying to once and for all ripping the rug out from these more conventional competitors, and and the truth probably lies somewhere in, in between. But yeah, we have seen demand for EVs being a little bit soft the last couple of quarters. We've seen. Tesla's competitors under huge, huge pressure at the moment. Uh, you know, they're still making money on their conventional cars, but losing money hand over fist on, on the EVs. Um, and so, yeah, there's probably a little bit of a pushback and people saying, you know, ICE is still here for a while. And, and it probably is. So it, it's a journey. It's a journey of, of ebbs and flows. In the long run, EVs still went through, uh, but it's not just going to be a straight line over the next couple of years. Okay, folks, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we, we've got an 11 o'clock cutoff. Um, there are numerous questions we haven't got around to answering yet. Um, there's about 700 people who attended this webinar. Um, but thank you to all of you. Thanks to the presenters and to the audience. Hopefully, we've given you some color of what we expect for the next 12 months. Uh, and for the week, let's just bask in the glory of uh, winning the 2023 World Cup. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.